So hello everyone, uh, I'm Minghao and I'm today like uh, I, would to, I would like to present uh, our work on this uh, data efficient graph grammar learning for molecule generations. Uh, this is like a joint work with uh, IBM folks. Um, uh, and it's like more like a neurosymbolic uh, combination like plus the neural network and uh, uh, symbolic representation for the chemistry model uh, like just as uh, Omar has introduced. Um, so to begin with, like we can first dive into what is the problem for molecule generation. Um, so the basic idea is that you have an input set of molecule structures uh, and you want to output like more diverse uh, molecule samples. Uh, and uh, at the core of this model is um, it's called a generative model. Um, and at the input side, you can have like different kind of representations like uh, you can use uh, you can convert those molecule structures into smell strings and these strings are kind of like typical representation for the uh, for molecules in chemistry and there are like many different kind of you, you could imagine like for a certain molecule graph you can have many different kind of string structures and there are some like canonical canonical form for the strings um, like this is like one traditional way for the input of the generative model uh, and there are some like more fancy ways that like, you can use some like uh, latent vectors, it can be learned from deep networks. Um, and you, based on these latent vectors, you learn a generative model to somehow like sample on the underlying embedding space to get like more, um, like, like basically like, like an encoder decoder structure to get like more different structures, uh, different molecule structures. Uh, and the, at the output side here, we want to like, uh, we, we have some like expectation on our uh, output. Like for example, like we want to make sure the output samples to be diverse enough. Um, all like we want the output should be as synthesizable as possible. Like we don't just want to generate garbage. It should be like um, indeed like synthesized in the reality and it could be useful for, uh, I mean, like future fabrication or what kind of like chemical analysis. Um, and like in, I think in the existing works, like the, I mean, like chemistry, like it's indeed a pretty popular area these days, especially when the COVID comes up. So there's like tens of papers um, I mean, happening like in, in recent years, but the general pipeline for the molecule generation is something like this. So like you, you collect a large side of training data and you convert it into some kind of representation like smell strings or the latent vectors we just, we just discussed. And then you like, you somehow train your generative model to get some normal generative molecules. molecules. So, so this is like a pretty general pipeline. Um, and like we, I mean, here, like I call the constraints or the expectation of your output as some like domain specific metrics, including the diversity or the synthesizability, all make all somehow like you want to get some molecules that have some like optimal properties. Like maybe it should be like, like for some polymers, it should be like really like crystal like, like it's pretty hard, or it should be as soft as possible. It can be easily being stretched. And these are kind of like anything that's kind of related to chemistry, it could be treated as some domain specific metrics. Um, and I think the most popular method in these days are, the, are these deep learning based generative models. So, uh, I mean, the, the, like the most popular one is just like the uh, auto encoder structure. Um, you have an encoder and a decoder and, um, and like, I think like in this pipeline, like for both the representation and the general model, they are kind of, Deep learning based methods. So they, they, they use some net, networks to convert the input molecules to a latent vector. And for the generative model, you could treat it as a, some kind of sampling function plus the decoder uh, on this um, latent space. So it's still like a neural network. Uh, but the problem of this deep learning based approaches um, is that like, they, they really like requires like a, a huge training data set. Like, typically it should, I mean, at least like, tens of thousands. Um, but the real problem is that the molecule data is actually not always abundant. Um, I think the, the problem especially uh, is very serious when we try to like, like generate one specific class of chemistry. So, um, so consider there's a case like um, we want to generate different kind of, oh, sorry, this question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Um, yeah, like I got so so like basically you want to know like what they how they evaluate the output, like how you evaluate the metric of your output. Is that? Yeah, it's, it's different for me. Mm -hmm. Or like how much the overlap is yeah. for more. Oh yeah, uh, so so I think like for most, uh, I mean it depends. Like I, I actually in the like deep learning based systems, I mean the like like for many methods, even the output of the chemical structures is not chemically valid. Like the valence in check, like like the, for for each carbon item, it should it can only connect to like four different items. But um, like many, I mean deep learning based methods, they are just like generate random stuff. Like it is not even chemically valid. It doesn't like it is. Not, it is even like impossible to synthesize in, in in reality. It doesn't just does not exist in chemistry. So, so what do you mean about like the feasible set or like the feasible region of the output? It's actually something we want to encode in our program, like like in our program synthesis or like why we want to use the. That's a major motivation why we want to use like the neural symbolic, like combine these together because that way itself like it's really hard to learn this kind of chemical or domain specific knowledge merely from a huge large. I mean huge data sets. So, so yeah, I think like you, your question is lying exactly on the motivation of the whole structure. So, do you have any theory limiting the general Yeah, like we have some, like I think in this pipeline, like we introduce some kind of metric here. Like we want to introduce, like, like yeah, this is a kind of heuristic, or you can treat that as some like optimization objective of your overall pipeline. And you want to optimize, optimize like towards this kind of targets. So um, yeah, like go back to the like the problem of the deep learning methods. Like um, like we have discussed, like they, they, they like usually like requires a lot of um, a large training data set. Uh, but like in reality, like the molecule data is not abundant. Um, and consider a case like um, I think like this also like us why we want to deal with this problem is that uh, I think our lab uh, is um, kind of like computational design fabrication. Like we we have a lot of like 3D printing stuff there and we want to have some like more novel polymer structures for 3D printing. Um, but we need to like get a kind of model to um, like to generate like novel polymer structures. Uh, but for like most of like 3D printing materials, like for they, they only like request certain, certain kind of like specific type of polymers. Uh, like in, like one of the cases I call the polyurethane and uh, actually polyurethane only consists of like three different kinds of monomers. And you want your generative model to generate like one specific type of monomer. You, do, you don't just like, don't want it, your model like generate everything, but because most of them are not used for your specific application. So that is some, something we are targeting in this project. Um, and the isocyanate is actually one of the poly, one of the three monomers uh, I mentioned about like the, for the polyurethane. Uh, and we searched through the literature and, and like sadly, we only found like 20, 20 samples uh, for the isocyanase. I mean, it's just like totally impossible to train a like large deep network for based on these 20 samples. And also that it's, it's not possible to fine tune on some like pre-trained networks because like you have too little, like too few samples and uh, it's kind of, it can be really easily like overfitting or it's still like generic garbage. Um, so we want to deal with this kind of problem as the data scarcity problem. Uh, and like before we dive into the deep, um, like how we deal with this problem, we, I, like I want to introduce a little bit like why we think like that this deep based, uh, deep learning based molecule generation is like super data I mean, hungry. Um, the underlying reason is that um, there is actually a common assumption for these like deep learning based network, networks uh, or deep learning based models uh, is that like the molecule structures can contain some like necessary information for the camera. Not, I mean, like the way you mentioned about like those, like feasible, how you define the feasible regions, how, what is the property values, like optimal property values or what is the like, chemical uh, constraints, like releasing constraints, like they are all included in the data sets. So, um, like they just like want to you like they just want to like learn this kind of chemical knowledge merely based on the training of the data sets. Um, and what they do about this um, is like you use some kind of like latent vectors. They have an embedding function, um, and they want to like, they want to make sure that the latent vector, which lies on a certain kind of embedding space, should somehow capture the chemical knowledge. So some so for example like. 
Um, maybe you can imagine there is a huge space for all the possible molecules, which contains like some of some of them are valid and many uh, many of the others like are invalid, and you have like an invalid space uh, on this uh, on this huge molecule space, uh, but the, like your probability on this uh, invalid space should somehow like only concentrate on those molecule structure that are valid. So, so like you, you somehow you want to learn this distribution for your uh, deep learning based model. Um, and here's like the, the framework for these uh, deep learning based models. Like uh, you have a training data set uh, and you somehow embed it to uh, like you, you, you convert these molecules into an embedding space and you will have, have a distribution for your training data sets. So this, this red distribution is the distribution for a huge data set. And you want to learn a general model that can operate on this embedding space that can, and that output like certain distribution. And you want to mean, like minimize the distance between these two distributions, or you want your general model to generate molecules that have a similar distribution compared to the training data set. Uh, and, and this is like the general, I think like, that's the, like almost all the deep learning based methods can be uh, formulated into this kind of distribution learning problem. Like you have some like loss function defined on distributions and then you go back propagate your gradient through your embedding function. And then like you perform the, I mean, the, the gradient updates and like the SGD, something like that. And um, you, will, you will somehow get up uh, like a good embedding function that can mimic the distribution. Um, but however, like the, I think the main argument here is that the latent vector is actually not an efficient representation. So, um, and there's the first problem is that actually the chemical space is very huge and it's very diverse and um, like molecules are essentially some graphs and it's like some combinatorial structures that like you can that you can like I mean, essentially you can cannot enumerate all the possible structures, all the possible graphs in your space. Uh, and then like, if you want to have like a reasonable distribution of approximation for your, even for your training data, you definitely need to have a very large one um, because like you have a small one, it's just some like a discrete, I mean, the distribution is not like as smooth enough as like compared to like you have a very huge data set. Um, and also like in many cases, like even you have a very huge training data set, um, like the deep learning based method, like it's like their scope still like struggling to learn very simple chemical constraints. I think here, like at least something, some of the existing works like uh, this validity is just like some really thin, really thin restriction check. And they, I mean, like some of the methods, like only like generally only six, I mean, 0.7% of the correct output. Like this is, it's just like, impossible to use in reality. Um, and like the funny joke is like, if you have a really hardworking chemical PhD, like um, you can just, uh, you can just like write down like all the chemical release and restriction in one afternoon. And you just like, you have some like post-processing process or like you filter out all the generated molecules based on your uh, deep learning networks and you will easily get 100% validity here. Oh, like you generate a fixed number of outputs using your general model, maybe like 10,000, something like that. And you uh, like check the correctness or the validity and calculate the percentage here. Yeah. Um, so like the features of an ideal representation should be, like should satisfy these two constraints or two, I'm not sure, the two aspects. Like the first one is like data efficiency um, for the use of like real applications. And the second one is like should be as expressive as possible, um, and like fortunately, like we have a symbolic based representation called the formal grammar that can satisfy these two, um, like uh, these two constraints. Um, and uh, this formal grammar uh, is not like a, I think it's not like a, it's not equal to the program, but it's like a more generalized, uh, I would say a more general concept uh, in in symbolic representations because. Uh, I think for every, every programming language, you should define some kind of domain specific grammar or domain specific language. So uh, this grammar is, uh, this formal grammar is, uh, is like more general for like, you can, can generate arbitrary language, like the language we're speaking like for any, I mean, countries or any, uh, anyone like, so, so this is like a very general concept, uh, like symbolic concept. Uh, and it can like satisfy, like you, you can use like a small number of rules to generate a large amount of samples and also like the, 
production rules in the formal grammar can specify some necessary constraints. So I, I would like uh, like introduce the grammar, like the, the formal grammar in detail later, uh, but I want to like, like uh, highlight how this kind of framework um, like align with this neural symbolic general model. Uh, I think like in the paper from, uh, I think the, like Oman just shared the, the paper, the, the neural and symbolic programming paper. And they, they are, they, that is like a huge, like it is a very, very great review paper on all the existing neural symbolic approaches. Uh, I think this, our pipeline lies in uh, one aspect of the, that uh, neural symbolic program is called a learning to synthesis. Uh, like in this in learning to synthesis, you have two separate stage. Like in your learning time, you have your training data set, you train a, a deep learning based model, and you convert this model into a, like a symbolic based model. Uh, and these two models uh, doesn't necessarily need to be trained separately, but you can somehow like train like, uh, like I mean, simultaneously, but essentially you want a, a symbolic based model. And at the test time, you just like, use this symbolic model uh, to satisfy your purpose. Like it can be some inference problem or it can, in our case, it's a generated model problem. Um, so this is like for the use time. Um, and that's like, uh, I think when we, like, like we can dive now into the formal grammar itself. So like formal grammar consists of like three different components. Uh, the first one is called this, uh, this terminal symbols, which is a capital N here. It is a set of like, uh, characters um, uh, and um, there's a yeah, the second side is called this non-terminal symbols uh, with some like uh, small letters um, uh, and uh, there's a, the most important set is this production rules which tells you like how to convert the uh, you can like there are like many possible rules and the rules that tells you like how to transform some character into a, a substring of characters um, so here is an example, like we can use this formal grammar to generate a sequence of strings. Uh, so starting from this first production rule, um, like you can, so like this, this first, uh, this first iteration, just like uh, you have a starting symbol S, it can replace this S with the right, right hand side of the first production rule, this ABSC here. Uh, and then like at the second iteration, you can find like um, one like uh, non-terminal, symbol in your current string and replace it with the right hand side of a production rule that is sampled from this uh, production rule set. And in this case, you replace this as with this uh, ABC here and uh, you can continue to do this uh, like for the current string, like in this case, it's just like swap the space between the A and B here. And like you continue to do it until there's like no non-terminal nodes or non-terminal symbols in your current string. So this is like the end of the, uh, of the generation uh, for a certain string. And of course, like you can use the same grammar for generating like multiple possible strings. Uh, like uh, show another example here, like you still start from this first production rule, but uh, at the second step here, you, don't replace, uh, you, you did not pick up the second rule, but instead you pick the first rule and it will give you some, this ABS here. Um, and then like you, like you continue working on the non-terminal symbols, um, just like randomly pick up the production rule from the set uh, until like you will have a gen, oops, sorry, uh, like a generated string, uh, string like this. This is like a, like three A, like three B and three C. Um, so you could imagine like um, there are like many different ways you like deploy the sequence of your production rules and it will, it will definitely generate a different uh, strings or a really huge set of strings. So the formal grammar itself is you can serve it, as, uh, it can serve as a generator model. Uh, and this is like for the stream base. I think most of the programming language or like uh, the language we're speaking like follow this kind of pattern like can define some verbs like uh, also like some like nouns or like, and like you you would put put a production rules just that tells you how to replace maybe one verb with like many possible verbs like um like uh like maybe one sentence is like I I go there or something like that and you can replace I with like you or with he like go there you can go replace with any other verbs like I, I program or I'm coding or something like that so um, this is like the basic structure of the formal grammar. Um, 
And then in our case, like we actually want to use this grammar, but uh, not on strings, but actually on molecules. So what we do first is like to convert these molecules into graphs, which is like very form, uh, like very natural like representation. Like uh, you just like replace each item with a certain like a certain type of node, and you place the re replace the bonds of the molecules into some edges in the graphs. And then based on this uh, graph representation, we uh, propose a kind of like graph grammar based uh, model. Um, so it's like the, the model is a very, it's kind of like similar to the string based model. Uh, but in this case, like we, we don't have non-terminal symbols, but we have some non-terminal nodes and we have like terminal nodes because these nodes are essentially represented in the, uh, in the graph like you generated. Uh, and the production rule set is something like, uh, not like replace the string itself, but replace a, uh, a subgraph of your current graph with another subgraph. So it's like kind of like expanding the graph um, uh, according to your production rule set. Uh, and here also a show example here is like, um, you're still from, the, from this starting symbol X um, and you deploy the, the first production rule which can replace this X with some like benzene ring like uh, structure. Um, and the second second iteration is that you you, you like you pick up the, the fourth production rule and like expand this these two non-terminal nodes uh, with another benzene ring. Um, and like this third step, like you play, replace uh, two R star here with the I'm not sure it's like it's like a and then three nodes. Um, it's like two steps, but uh, deploy them um, I mean simultaneously. Uh, and the, the final step is you re replace this final R with these two items. So, and then like you can use like this graph grammar to generate a molecule graph and it can be converted to a, a certain molecule. Uh, and the same way as the, is uh, uh, this question. Sounds like the answer is low. Yeah. Oh yeah, like uh, we will introduce the optimization framework later. Yeah, then, I mean, then we are, now like I'm just like demonstrating how the graph grammar works, uh, but later we will show like how to learn this graph grammar with respect to some optimal values. So, so like optimal functions are like, yeah. So this is like a whole pipeline, but just I want to introduce the graph grammar concept first. Yeah, <laughs> that is fine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like the advantage of graph grammar is like data efficiency, of course, because you have a small set of number of rules, you can possibly like generate many different structures and it, it is explainable. And also it is, it, it is expressive enough. Uh, and also actually I think for in the, for the formal grammar, we have many related works from different fields. Um, I think one uh, popular example is actually in computer graphics. Uh, it's called a procedural modeling. Like you can use a predefined uh, graph grammar or I think in computer graphics called some like IO system. Like, uh, like you still have a set of rules and it can generate like different plans. Like, I'm oh, sorry, uh, like you can generate trees or you can generate like a, a city or a buildings. I think like in most of the gaming engines, like uh, when you play any games, like all the trees or like all the grass on the grounds, or all the like, uh, I'm not sure if your cities there, they, they are based on some procedural modeling tools because it's impossible for an artist to enumerate all the individual building or individual plants in your game. Um, and also like I think in computer vision, there are some like um, grammar-based systems, like they basically they are using these models for seeing understanding like they you have a, a mostly indoor scene and you decompose in um, the components or like the the I'm not sure the object lying in the scene like into some like groups or like some sub components like um, to make sure that you can understand the scene I think this is also pretty helpful in some like robotic navigation uh, also like doing some like physics information from pure vision input um, and also I think in chemistry itself, there are some like related works used in the formal grammar. Um, I, I just list uh, like four or uh, five uh, different works. Um, but the problem of all these like formal grammars for chemistry 
uh, is that they are mainly like manual design. Like they, they should like hire some like chemical PhD or chemical expert to design the grammar uh, by hand. And it's definitely a very tedious process like lying on the higher line on the, like the, the expertise on the chemistry. Uh, and also like it's kind of hard to design for design rules for some like complicated constraints. So it's, it's kind of easy to write down the Williamson constraints, but maybe it's hard to make sure like you're right, like, like handling hand writing down rules to satisfy some like uh, synthesizability because like uh, whether you, like you, how you judge a certain molecule can you synthesize or not is actually based on the number of like available natural reactions you have in your like research lab or in your wet lab. So you should have, you should have some access to the code base or like not code base, like the reaction database of the, of your company or of the lab. And you should somehow like make sure that the certain product, I mean, for some molecule, it can be synthesized in one lab, but it cannot in the other because some other lab doesn't have necessary uh, facilities or necessary, I'm not sure, like uh, reaction expertise, but, uh, but like, so, so you need to like be some, somehow like a uh, customize, like your grammar rules should be uh, like automatically fit your um, available uh, instruments. So uh, it's kind of hard to design grammar rules just manually uh, like, like that can satisfy these kind of complicated constraints. Um, so uh, here's the, the, the problem statement of the, of the overall problem. Um, and so like you, the input is a small set of examples uh, and what we want to uh, target on is like a really small set of examples, like basically like a, a few dozens, it's not like a tens of thousands. And the output is a gra graph grammar based uh, generative model, which can like generate uh, novel molecule structures based on the grammar production. Um, and what we want here is actually an automatic learning system. Like we don't need any uh, like manual work and this learning can also optimize a certain type of or, or a certain set of um, like metrics you want um, like the property you want all the uh, the synthesizability or the diversity you want um, and for this automatic learning part um, we use like some uh, the so-called bottom-up construction it's actually a concept from the program synthesis um, it's like you have a bunch of input and output pairs and you want to find, figure out the, 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 like the, the perfect or the proper program that can generate the, or they, they can synthesize this uh, input output pairs. Um, and in our case, like we are not generating programs and we are generating some like graph grammars. Um, and the high level idea is like uh, you have an input set of molecules and you convert it into graphs uh, and you want to like know what is the specific production rules uh, for your graph grammar. Um, like uh, the intuition is that you need to progressively collapse the edges of all the input graphs until they become like single nodes. So this is like how, like why the concept of the bottom up comes here. Like uh, the, like you break down all the, like you break down the input graphs into the basic elements. Uh, what basic ele elements means is like the basic, <clears throat> the basic edges or like the, the basic items are the basic rings. Like you break down, break, break them down into pieces, and then you progressively build up the these basic elements until like they become the the, the original molecule graph. And uh, during the process, you like progressively collapsing or pro progressively building up. You can convert each uh, like at each step, you can generate a production rule for your grammar. Um, and more specifically, like, like uh, in this case, we can like randomly pick up the edges from the input graphs. And uh, for example, like we select these uh, four edges and then like we can collapse them into like um, a certain, uh, into a non-terminal node. Is that a question? I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so like you, you see here, like we collapse this uh, select the edges into the non-terminal node. Uh, and at work here. Um, so, uh, and at this step, you can construct a, a, a like a, a, a production rule. Um, and the left hand side of this production rule is the is this non terminal symbol, and the right hand side is the selected edge you have for your 
for, for this iteration. Um, and you can like continue working on this uh, progressively construction or progressively collapsing. Uh, like in the second step, you randomly pick up these, these edges um, and you collapse them into one non terminal node, which also in this case, the left hand side is the non terminal node and the right hand side is the, the selected subgraph. Um, like this, I think, yeah, we are still collapsing and. Um, until like you come like you convert everything into the into like the single non-terminal node here, uh, the, the, which is a starting node. So um, like once you have this process, actually the production rules tells you what is the inverse process to generate this uh, like the, the input set of molecules. Like what you need to do is just like you, you start from the starting symbol and you sequentially apply the production rule you constructed, and it will like inversely gives you the um, the input molecule uh, for the output of the grammar production. Um, and like, um, like you can imagine that there are many like possible sequences to select the edges uh, and like the way you select edges at each step um, actually determines the grammar, the final output grammar. So here's like some collection, like uh, some, some connection between the uh, I mean, between the grammar and the parameters we want to optimize because essentially we want to optimize some grammar and you need to some, somehow to parameterize your grammar. And this is the intuition like why we, um, like, 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 like how the grammar can be optimized. Like the, there are many possible sequences to select the edges and we just need to choose the best possible sequence to find the best grammar. Yep. Uh, what do you mean by compact set? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, actually, yeah, actually that's something we can optimize in the final objective. Like the number of rules or like, uh, I think like you can concentrate on that. We, we have tried something like that before actually. I like the number of rules and how, how compact your grammar is. And also like when you have a really compact set of grammar, I don't think like it can generate really diverse uh, molecules. Um, there are some like weak company, uh, like connection there, but I'm not sure there's some trade off there, but you can optimize both. Like you have like some balance by ways and optimize these two matches. Yeah, but there's something we can optimize actually. Yeah. Um, and like this goes to the next part, like how we optimize this grammar construction or we want to have the best grammar. Um, so just as uh, uh, I said, You mean the probability? That, that's actually the parameterization part. Like that's part. <laughs> you can use like inference volume optimization to optimize the probability you define on each edge. Yeah. Um, so like the bottom up construction is totally determined by the sequence of the collapse edges. Um, and like you can somehow like define, uh, like because you can let's imagine like there is a rank for each edge that tells you like when the, Edge should be collapsed, like at what specific iteration, because the sequence of the collapse, uh, collapsing edges determine the grammar, and then you can just like put a rank on each edge. Um, and this somehow like converted to a minimal spanish problem because it will determine the order of the edges for, for input graph, like, uh, like minimal spanish let's just, just enumerate all the edges uh, with respect to some like edge, edge weight functions. Um, and like then like you can define some like edge wave function for each edge on your graph. And this edge wave function can be, uh, like this edge one like determines the constructed grammar because the edge function determines the, the rank of, the, of all the edges and the rank of all the edges determines the, the sequence of the collapsing edges of your construction rules and the sequence of production rules uh, determines the grammar, the final output grammar. So there's like, the, so we convert the, construction of grammar into the optimization of the edge weight function. Like this is like a kind of like one-to-one -one map. It's not a one-to-one, -one map, but it's kind of like a function, like input the edge weight function, it will output the grammar. Um, and the optimization goal is uh, like we just use, uh, in this case, we only use two uh, goals, but it, uh, it definitely can be any arbitrary metric you want for your grammar. 
Uh, the first one is called diversity. The second one is the validity, which is uh, whether the molecule can be synthesized or not. And you want to maximize the, this objective with respect to the parameter of your attribute function. Um, so the, I mean, you can use like, uh, like you can define an individual weight for each edge, but uh, like your input graph, uh, I mean, like it's like uh, the size of the graph is uh, it's definitely not uh, homogeneous. So you would definitely want some like parameterized function. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, like for your input set of molecules, so you perform this kind of construction for all the input set of molecules. Okay. So you at least make sure like you can recover the input set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, it's like, uh, I think like you convert, like you recover the input set. This is like, um, this is like for sure, uh, but definitely you can combine the parameter rules for generating normal molecules, I guess. Yeah, but I think that there's a molecule layer. Oh, it's invalid, I see. Yeah, yeah, like that's actually a problem. Like, yeah, that's actually a problem. I and mean, then how you to enhance the robustness of your model is actually something we're trying to do. Like once we summon the paper, I think we discuss about that like, robustness. Oh, that's a question. Yeah, I think that's something reasonable I would say. Uh, and actually in practice, we indeed like, uh, I mean, like in, like in algorithm, you can use this uh, balanced ways. Like, like suppose like you, you like you introduce like, like the, you, you multiply the diversity metric with a really small, a small weight in your final objective and it will make sure like the diversity, like they will not generate super diverse samples. But, but why we have, we have to introduce these two, two constraints, like first is diversity, the other is the synthesizability here, is that we want to treat all these two stuff. Because if you only optimize the synthesizability or the validity here, it will only generate the input samples. And the grammar will be, it, not, it does not explore too much. We have like a experiment section, I think we will show later in the experiments, like if you balance, if you change the value of the lambda here, you get a really diverse generative model, or you get some like, like there's a part of the fine line between these two measures here. Yeah, yeah, I totally knew, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, uh, but I mean, that, that, that depends on like how you define the function for diversity, I guess. I mean, like if it's just like different from the training set, then like it's a really simple metric. But in our case, we don't like use that function. We actually use some like, you generate a set of molecules and you use like, a, I think you still convert with some like continuous feature vectors using some handcrafted features, like some fingerprints. And you have like some measures to measure the, the distribution of this continuous vector to your training data set. So that is called a terminal, I can't remember the exact name, but there's like a feature distance or like a distribution distance between the general samples and uh, your like maybe target samples, something like that. So it's not exactly the, it, it does not like only measure like, so like, like you have a, maybe like suppose you have a training data set and you pick up one of the molecules and you just add one single item to your molecule, then you, this will give you like a totally different molecule, like in the sense of your metric for diversity. But in the sense, but, but when you use, if you gave like this two, this molecule and then you threw the, to the, to, to this one to the diversity function evaluation in our case, like in the continuous distribution matching case, 
this will be like the diversity is zero because like you did not introduce any new atom and you just add one single atom to the existing molecule. It's not like a, I would say it's not like a really, really true uh, metric. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's like, it's actually a pretty complicated process. It's like a, uh, like the ratio synthesis. I'm not sure. Like there's a, like you have a reaction database, and you have your generated molecule, which is your target product, and you perform a search algorithm in your reacting database to make sure you have a sequence of reactions that can output your product. If it is true, then it's valid. It's like it can be indeed synthesized. So, would you sell some programs into this? It's like a chemical plant where you're talking about you're trying to see if you can find which reactions have the most potential. Exactly. If you're each molecule, you're going to be that yeah, yeah. Like you run their search process, and like the reaction database can be different for different labs, like, like that scenario I discussed in the beginning. So, yeah. Like now it's a binary score, but you generate like maybe 10,000 samples and calculate the percentage of the success rate and then put it in the object. But it can be like something, uh, I think the, the, the search algorithm I use is come, like some A-star search, like really true one, but guided by some neural network. Uh, There's another paper called the retro star. Like they specifically focus on the retro synthesis using a neural network class search algorithm. And they, they indeed output some kind of like uh, non-binary score, but uh, we didn't use that, just use the percentage of success in rate. Yeah, I use the right of start, yeah. yeah. Oh, you mean the right of start is at all? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. The size of like the reaction database yeah, or like the oh like the molecule is yeah like the molecule database I think uh it's a super huge, huge I think uh is this one is like uh 80, 80k something like that or only for polymers like I think but it's like for general polymers not like for specific type of polymers that's actually what the problem we are targeting but for in general polymers that are actually huge database like collected from some I think uh there's some like public Data, like government public data sets for maybe past like 50 years, like all the published uh, chemical papers that discover some new polymers that they put it in the database. Yeah, yeah exactly, all set in Korea, yes. Um, yeah, like these are the two, two metrics we discussed. Uh, and this lambda function is just like a balance factor between these two objectives. Um, and uh, I think the annoying part or the, the most uh, fancy part about the whole project is actually how you compute the gradient with respect to the edge wave function because you want to optimize the theta here, parameter theta here. Um, and uh, it's, not, it's definitely not differentiable because uh, it involves too, ma too many like, functions like combinatorial optimizations, the minimum spanning tree, and you construct a grammar. Um, like the minimum spanning tree itself is not differentiable, and uh, how you construct the grammar is not differentiable. Uh, and how you evaluate your objective is also not differentiable because you have a grammar and you generate many samples, and then you calculate the, the like the diversity or the validity you you, you measured, and it's like nothing is differentiable here. So uh, we just construct a problem using inference, and um, it's basically like you convert the uh, attribute function not like a deterministic function, but as well some like a, a probability that like, can be sampled on this uh, on, according to this attribute function and. Um, so we define a probability on each edge of the graph. It's like a sigma function of your edge rate function. And the objective will be converted to some like expectation. I think it's a standard. So, um, I think if you are uh, like familiar with some like skull function estimation in the inference, it's like some standard way to do this. Um, and you can use like many, any uh, like zero order estimator, which we use reinforce in this case. Um, and like more specifically, like we define a 
Bernoulli uh, random variable on each edge, uh, which the distribution is um, with respect to the C, uh, to the phi here, and the phi is the symbol function of the uh, edge weight function. And the edge weight function is a two-layer MLP, which uh, takes the, some features, the feature vectors on the edges. And this feature vector is some something we get from the a pre, like a phase pre-trained graph neural network. And this paper is, a, I think it's a pretty famous paper from Stanford. Like they uh, somehow like discover several techniques to pre-train huge networks, graph neural networks that they have some like, they define some semi-supervised settings and they offer the pre-trained models and they show that these pre-trained models can be super helpful in many downstream tasks, uh, like both for both chemistry and biology. So we just like deploy the pre-trained model here. Um, and the probability of your constructed grammar, which is the PG here, is just like a um, like uh, you, you like you have some like function, which is a C, the construction function, like involves all the uh, all the like sub components or sub process I described about the grammar construction, including the minimum spanning tree, the how you collapse the edges and how you convert the edges, collapse, uh, select the edges into the production rules. This is like a single function C and uh, we treat like the, all the edges ID and it's, it will give you like a joint, uh, it give, give you a probability of your constructed grammar, which is just like a joint distribution of all the um, random variables on the edges. Uh, and you optimize your objective, uh, which is an expectation here. Um, and you calculate gradient using the reinforced trick. Um, like you have some like log probability here. Um, so here, this is the first question. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Uh, you mean the initialization for the probability or the initialization for the uh, for the for the optimization or oh, optimizing? I see. Um, like initially, you just. Uh, uh, like you, you initial like your Bernoulli random variable, like you define a Bernoulli random variable on each edge, uh, and you can initialize as like a, like because like the x can be equal to zero or one, the probability is equal like zero point five. Your parameter will be the parameter of your Bernoulli distribution will be zero point five, something like that. It can be equally, and also like you can use some like predefined distribution, like which is not the uniform distribution in this case. Uh, actually, we did not try different distributions uh, because, like, uh, the algorithm itself will guarantee like you can converge to any uh, to converge to the ultimate distribution, no matter how your initialization is. Uh, but definitely, if you have a better initialization, it will converge faster. And I don't think it will affect the diversity metric here because, uh, like, you are maximizing a certain uh, output, and um, even though like your initialization like one initialization is better than the other, you are still optimizing. Like you are maximizing the, any of the metrics. So uh, I don't see like there's, a, it's like a very, um, I mean, like burden here is a very like huge important, uh, huge problem here. So just like it, 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 can, uh, it only affects the convergence speed of the whole algorithm. Oh no, we did, we didn't. Of oh, the MLP here, it is optimized, but the pre-trained network, no. Yeah, it's like a very perfect step. Uh, no, we did not. Just uh, uh, I guess like for PPO or, or like a trust region, something like that, uh, it should be helpful. Uh, I mean, like is there need some like zero order estimation, so it will definitely be helpful here. Uh, but we just try like the most naive, like <laughs> the reinforce. Yeah. I think there are many other like zero as zero all the estimation is like pretty popular field now, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> yeah, we should incorporate more. <laughs> yeah. um, so the experiments, um, we like, uh, like we perform the experiment on three, I create a class specific polymer data set from literature, like each of them only consists like around a few dozen samples. Uh, and uh, 
like this experiment is something like we want a specific molecule type to fulfill some like inter ingredients uh, requirements. Um, there, here are some samples. And the second data set is a super large data set, uh, which the one I mentioned about like uh, ATK some uh, polymer database. Um, and it consists of some like large data set and it's already like well evaluated on existing benchmarks. Um, and first I show some like quality results. Um, like the, the left here is the learned grammar and the right here is the molecule generated using the learned grammar. Uh, I think the interesting part of the learned grammar is that um, there are some like production rules that directly correspond to the characteristic functional groups of your input data set. So I think this is like the functional group for the isocyanate and this one is for the acrylate, uh, which is like two of the three uh, data sets we are considering. So, so like, um, like your grammar can indeed like interpret something uh, useful, like that can directly tell you something. It's kind of explainable to some like chemical knowledge. Uh, for example, like those functional groups that determine the types of the chemistry or types of the molecules. Uh, and like more uh, quantity results, um, like we compare the domain specific matrix, this one's the diversity, and the other one is the validity, which is the, the retrosynthesis rate, short for R is here. And, um, like we indeed improve based on existing works a lot, but uh, still like far from perfect, it's like you're only around 30%. But um, I mean, as we said, like the reaction database uh, is actually varies from lab to lab and we just use a common one, like uh, existing, like, and, and like they they only provide, like the for the reaction, retro synthesis, you not only need to provide the reaction database, but also need to provide the starting point of your product. And I guess in our case, the starting point is very different from the polymer. Like they use some pre preset, but if you start from like more polymer friendly uh, reactants, then it should be increased larger. And we have some like our collaborator from IBM, they are operating on something. Um, like the we have a collaboration with a chemical company and like uh, I think they are trying to use this algorithm for like more like reliable or like more, I mean, um, like reaction or retrosynthesis techniques like existing in the real world. Uh, and also like uh, the percentage of the molecules belong to the concern part, uh, like uh, we call the member shape here, uh, like it indeed increase a lot. Um, like we don't, we only, we indeed like generate a lot of like molecules uh, of a certain type. Uh, and also like some other common use metrics in the papers that we can still achieve the state of the art. And this is the result for the, those uh, three small polymer data sets, data sets and on the large polymer database, um, because it consists of like around 80K samples, uh, we actually don't use the complete data set. We just like random sample around uh, like 100 samples, I guess, like 0.15% of the original data sets. And we perform the fitting like grammar learning algorithm based on the, the pipeline we, uh, we just discussed. Um, and we compare the performance with those deep learning frameworks that are learned on the huge, on the, on the kind of complete data set. So it's like a super, like our model is like super detail efficient. Like, uh, like you use, only use like 100 samples from the original data set to achieve the comparable performance. Yeah, like we can, but uh, I mean, the problem is that you, like the, at that time, the code is like far from optimized. <laughs> like we can all use like some parallel sampling or <laughs> like, like for MC something, I didn't even use the parallel version. <laughs> but, but I mean, I, I've been working on the like, code speed up a lot. And I think at least it can handle like a few thousand. It's not, it's, it's nothing. But that would be, I mean, in some reason, like they are using a PyTorch framework, they are GPU based and like you can convert everything you're using like some tensor functions and performing in parallel. Uh, but those like combinatorial optimization is not uh, easily parallel. Uh, I'm sure some distributed system. But, uh, and also, you mentioned that there are some other work modules where they start with a grammar that's supposed to, like, with like, expertise. Is it yeah. possible to use the output from your system to build techniques? Yeah, yeah. I think that they, they manually define this grammar, they can be converted into the grammar forming, like the gram graph grammar form. Uh, in our case. So you can use like the initialization, like some kind of initialization from there. Method and yeah, so 
uh, I think like this stone paper is pretty interesting, but um, they are like uh, still like stream based method, stream based grammar, and uh, it's not like because I, I mean like once you want to convert a graph into a string, there are some like MP problem there. Like you are essentially doing the indexing for the grammar for the graph, and it's definitely not uh, unique like the stream representation. So I don't think that stream representation is a good one in this case, but. Um, Uh, and like, here's the trade-off between the diversity and the validity. Like, uh, I think the answer to all the questions before, like, uh, if you change the parameter, the balance, balancing weight between your two objectives, you can have different set of grammars that, that can have different, uh, like, performance. And it's kind of lying on the part of front of, uh, uh, of two, like, uh, of your, of two, I mean, of the two metrics you are, you are concerning and, um yeah like this this like performs on two different data sets like you can like you can have grammars like ranging from like super high diversity like so, so you're closing like to uh, 1.1 1 .1, and also you can have some like i mean for this grammar like the the synthesizability is pretty low like only 50 percent of the output can be synthesized and uh, the other kind of this like for the other cases the same um yeah I think that's pretty much the end of the talk. And, and we provide a code, um, the source code. And also uh, we have a small demo, which is conducted by the IBM folks. Uh, I think uh, you can get the demo. Yeah, if you want to take pictures of this. Uh, I think the, I can show the demo first. Um, It's actually a pretty simple demo if you go to this link. Um, it's like there was a software engineering team. They, they like, they produce like this website for us. Uh, it's like, uh, I'm sure it's like funny enough, but it's like, how, like, like um, I mean, the target of for this demo is like, you have a specific molecule, uh, and like using our algorithm, you can convert this molecule into a set of grammars, uh, you know, set of grammar, uh, grammar rules, production rules. And what you do here, or what you play here is how you, like you need to pick up the grammar rules from the, um, from your generated set to make sure that you can generate the target molecule, something pretty childhood, but um, like you can tap your random name here, maybe it's a test, let's go to the hard case. So this is like your target. Um, so it's a pretty huge one. And this is like the, your initial um, substring, uh, initial subgraph, like these, um, like this box here, like the square node here is some like non-terminal nodes that you can expand using a certain grammar rule. Like what you can do, you can click one of the non-terminal nodes and you'll pick up one of them. Uh, these production rules, maybe this is here, and um, maybe I select another one and I do this and continue to do this. Okay, there's no non terminal node in this current graph, and yeah, like, uh, and I cannot output this <laughs> molecule, so I'm this is a failure here. But and you can do like you can delay them, delay the <laughs> uh, to select the average edge and starting from the front. Uh, like you do, you just like manually perform a search <laughs> by yourself. So, so something that is a small demo. Uh, and this is uh, something you can play with uh, to get an understanding of how like the grammar can be combined or can produce uh, different molecule graphs. And also, I think if you go to the code base, um, we, uh, like we have all these kind of uh, instructions. Uh, actually, I tried like uh, last night. I tried to deploy this whole stuff on CoLab, but uh, there are some problem. I'm sure why the importing like the uh, once I want to import some packages, there's something wrong there. Uh, but I indeed have this kind of this uh, IPython code here, uh, this Jupyter notebook. Uh, so there are some like detailed instructions like how you need to download the code from the link, and uh, we also provide the. Uh, the checkpoint files, like the, the trained grammar. And you need to set up the environment by running these commands. These sound like, uh, 
like basic environments, like including the PyTorch and some like PyTorch geomet geometric packages. Uh, and like you can play with the trained model. Um, uh, like we load uh, here, like we load the pre-trained grammar and um, we can like generate the grammar, like randomly generate some new molecules from the, the pre-trained ones. I think there are some examples here, I guess. Um, like, yeah, these are like the molecules generated using the grammar. Um, I think there's like really funny ones, like this huge ring <laughs> and like huge ring plus many clouds. Um, but uh, these are just basically some generated samples you can play with. And also you can train your own model, uh, but it's without automation. Like we just, just like perform the bottom up search of your input molecules because the automation is, uh, the code is, is like, I don't want people looking into the optimization code. It's too shitty, but <laughs> <laughs> I think like at least that without optimization, like you can uh, you can still get some grammar, but it's not optimized. Uh, so you can play with this stuff uh, there. I think that's pretty much about my talk. And I'm sure there's any questions or anything we can discuss. The model, uh, I mean, this code base takes a lot of time. Like for like 100 samples, maybe it's around like 20 minutes or something. It's about an hour. So it's not parallel. The main problem is that the MC something is not in parallel, I, but it definitely can be in parallel. I'm trying to implement, I'm, I'm like spending most of my spare time to implement like a C++ based graph grammar implementation, like get rid of all this stupid Python stuff and making it more efficient. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure there's any questions from Zoom or. Oh, yep. And just put it here. Then. Oh, uh, like the diffusion stuff, you mean, or like molecules? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, data efficient, uh, data, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like, thank you. Uh, I, I, uh, I think like it really depends on the application. I think, um, I mean, the algorithm, I mean, like there are many different people working on different domains, like even for generative model, like there are many different directions. Like some of them like working on like super huge models, like want to have like as many as possible data in as input and they have a really generalized version of the model. It can be deployed to any downstream task. There are many people working on that. I think there is a one, one re reference paper from Stanford. There's a the whole group are working on this kind of graph-based fermentation that they have many applications on chemistry. Yeah. Um, exactly, yeah. Some class, polymers. Some class on polymers and it's still pretty helpful, I think, in, in like reality. So um, like you need some data efficient model. That's like, I mean, it's just different branches of research. I don't, I don't think that is like one like standard, like golden criteria to like evaluate all the methods, but yeah. Oh, like uh, there are actually a lot of our works. Uh, like one of them we have already constructed is a grammar-based property predictor. Um, it's like, um, it's still like super data efficient because like it's like a major, benefit of the symbolic representations. Like it doesn't need a like super, super huge amount of data. Um, and I think like the application case is still the same. Like you have a small set of samples uh, and your property predictor, maybe like you are predating some really difficult or really, I mean like, uh, I'm not sure labor costing properties of the chemistry, like some like uh, glass transition temperature of the polymer structure. Uh, it's like super hard to evaluate uh, and like you don't have a huge data set and how you evaluate, you, you use like, you utilize this kind of grammar-based representation for your property predictor. And we we, we actually developed a kind of algorithm like uh, 
if this grammar representation or this grammar generation model can like, uh, I mean, can construct a, like a geometry or something like that for different molecules or for different graphs. It can tell you like how similar different graphs is or di different molecule is like in a sense of like a graph distance or graph editing distance, something like that. And based on this kind of geometry, you can do property predictor for this. So this is like one line of research is that you can continue developing the chemical design, computational chemistry design. You have general model, you have property predictor, then you can perform optimization to find the target molecule or you do the inverse design of the molecule, something like that. And also another way is like we, this general model can be deployed to many different applications beyond chemistry, like uh, the applications I mentioned about the graphics, like how you generate the trees, the buildings, or more interesting, like for 3D shapes. Um, I think there's like not too many work these days focusing on like 3D shapes. Uh, like we, we know like all these diffusion models, like text, text to image, but for 3D shapes, I don't think it's like, there are some papers, uh, very recent papers and published like last month, like from text to 3D shapes, uh, but like the quality of 3D shapes, it's just, it looks sucks. So um, like we want to generate some like high quality 3D mesh, then I guess like symbolic representation is some way we can, something we can try. Thank you. All right, so we have an hour left for lunch, so feel free to talk. It's got more call up, right? So yeah, uh, like on the kit. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's not on the kit. Yeah, but I have all the stuff. So feel free to do that. So you will be here. So you can ask questions. So we have an hour to do that. And there's lunch, then the sessions at one.